years back when Ajahn Suat taught a meditation retreat at IMS. One of the questions he was given toward the end of the retreat was how to bring meditation into daily life. And so he talked about the precepts. And afterwards, one of the people who had organized the retreat was very upset, feeling that John Swat was talking down to the lay people, assuming that all they could handle was the precepts and they couldn't handle real meditation, which was not his purpose at all. His purpose was to point out that the precepts form a very important part of the meditation. Remember, the word to meditate in Pali means to develop the mind. And you don't develop the mind solely when you sit here with your eyes closed not doing anything. You have to develop it while you're doing things, while you're acting, while you're moving, while you're speaking. It's like learning how to chew gum and to walk at the same time. You act and develop the mind at the same time. You speak and develop the mind at the same time. And that way we create all this, a lot of the skills that you need as a meditator. Because the precepts ba basically are teaching and restraint. And this applies to all four of the, what they call the, the precepts or principles of purity. Sometimes the Ajahns in Thailand like to shock people by saying, well, monks have only four precepts. But this is what he meant. This is what they mean, is that you have the precepts that we think of in terms of lay people, the five precepts, the monks have the precepts of the Bodhimokkha. That's one set of precepts. And on top of that, you have restraint of the senses, purity of livelihood, and contemplation of the requisites. All of these things are precepts. They help you to exercise restraint in what you do and what you consume. And doing here is not only moving your body, but also moving your eyes deciding what you want to listen to, what you don't want to listen to, how you're going to listen to things, what you're going to listen for, what you're going to look for, and so on through the senses. The basic list of precepts is to remind you you don't want to act in ways that are harmful, either to yourself or to other people. It makes you stop and think that what you do has an impact on others. And of course, the, the basic list of precepts are aimed at your intentional actions. They want you to observe your intentions when you speak, when you act, when you do anything. What's the reason? What's the purpose for what you're doing? So many of us are oblivious to these things. And when you're oblivious to these blatant actions, how are you going to be able to watch the more subtle intentions in the mind? And furthermore, if your intentions are to harm other people, and when you sit down to meditate, the thought of that harm is going to loom large in the mind. And your reaction is either going to be regret a sense of guilt, or else denial. And none of those attitudes are helpful in the meditation, to sit down and simply look at the mind as it's acting and moving. It's a lot easier to let go of the past when you look at the past and say, well, there's really nothing I've intended that's harmful either for myself or for other people. There's a lot less entanglement as you allow the mind to settle down. to so just the basic list of precepts as a beginning instruction in meditation.
it gets more refined when you start thinking about restraint of the senses. And John Swat once pointed out that as you practice the eight precepts, it's basically adding restraint of the senses to the five precepts. The precept against eating afternoon places some restraints on your tongue. The precept against singing, dancing, going to shows, that places restraints on your ears and your eyes. The precept against lying on high and luxurious beds places a restraint on the body. The precept against wearing perfumes places a restraint on your nose. In other words, these precepts remind you that if you're looking for pleasure in things outside, you're really abandoning the mind. It's a good principle to place some restraints on yourself so that it almost forces you to look inside for pleasure. As the Buddha said, the main reason we go for our outside pleasures is because we see no other escape from pain, from displeasure. And so we go after the pleasures of the senses. And when you're constantly hungering after those things, the potential for finding a different kind of pleasure inside gets starved. So you want to place some restraints on yourself and the types of pleasures you look for outside. That gets you more and more focused inside, that, that this is where the real issue lies. If you're going to find a pleasure that's true and lasting and reliable, you've got to look inside. And the restraints you place on the way you look for pleasures outside helps maintain that focus. Purity of livelihood reminds you you've got to consider the consequences of how you go about trying to maintain this body. For again, if there are, is any dishonesty in the way you maintain your livelihood, or if there's any harm in the way you do it, it's going to lead to a dishonesty in the mind itself. If you reflect on the way you've led your livelihood, and there's a sense of harmlessness. It really does help with the meditation. It gives you more strength, more confidence. It's the same principle as when you look at your precepts. You look back, you don't see you've harmed anybody. It's a lot easier for the mind to settle down with clarity and honesty and no self-deception. And the same principle goes into reflection on the requisites. On the one hand, that reflection is designed to make you realize that you don't want to spend too much on keeping yourself fed, keeping yourself clothed, looking for shelter, looking for medicine. You eat just enough to keep the body going and healthy. You have just enough clothing to keep it warm in the winter, cool in the summer. Keep it covered in a way that's not offensive to other people. That's all you really need. You think of all these people with closets full of clothing, and what a waste it is. How the money used for that kind of thing could be used for so many better things, things that are more helpful. both to the individual and to the society at large. So that's one aspect of the reflection on the requisites. The other is to remind you that we are living in this body that is just full of needs. The fact that you're born here means you have to find food, clothing, shelter, medicine, otherwise the body can't keep going. And even when you eat with restraint, clothe yourself with restraint.
show of restraint in your shelter and your medicine, there's still a burden that's placed on yourself and having to keep finding more and more of these things to keep the body going, and on other people, other beings. That's to remind you of why we're meditating here, is to get out of this cycle of feeding entirely. So the precepts aren't just sort of elementary Sunday school rules for keeping people neat and orderly. They're also an integral part of the practice in training the mind, developing good qualities of mind. And they spur you on to look deeper and deeper inside. Through happiness that causes no harm for anyone at all, places no burden on anyone at all. This is one of the Buddha's most radical discoveries, is that your gain doesn't necessarily have to mean other people's loss. In the ordinary way of the world, that's the way it is, especially when it has to do with material things. If you get something, other people have to be deprived of it. And that's the basic pattern of so many people's way of finding happiness. But he discovered that there's a way that ultimately gives you the truest happiness of all, and at the same time causes no harm to anyone. You can begin to see that in the practice. There's that famous simile of the acrobats. One acrobat is standing on the shoulders of the other, and as the Buddha said, it, each acrobat has to look after himself, and in looking after him or herself, each helps the other. In other words, you maintain your balance. It makes it a lot easier for other people to maintain theirs as well. So as the Buddha pointed out, as you're practicing, when you're developing goodwill and acting on goodwill to other people, they benefit, and so do you. When you're kind and generous, other people benefit, and so do you. At the same time, when you're working in a purely internal way on the mind, trying to develop mindfulness, alertness, concentration, discernment, you're not the only one who benefits. When you show more restraint in your actions, other people are freed from a lot of harm that could otherwise come from you. When you don't act on greed, anger, and delusion, other people are not subject to your greed, anger, and delusion, so they benefit as well. And as you work on the practice, you find that your ability to develop a happiness inside that places less and less and less on a burden on other people gets more and more refined. So ultimately you find the happiness it is totally harmless in every way, i.e. the unconditioned. So the precepts point toward the unconditioned. In the course of maintaining the precepts, you're developing good qualities of mind that are going to be helpful in the meditation. And they provide an orientation. It keeps reminding you, if you're going to look for happiness, you've got to look for it within. Because that's where the only happiness that's truly satisfying can be found. So it's good to take the precepts seriously, because they're essential to the training. As the Buddha said, the arising of a virtuous state of mind is a precursor to the path, in the same way that the dawn is a precursor to the sun. So this is the direction they lie. <clears throat> this is the direction they point. So don't take them lightly. They are essential to bringing meditation into daily life and making your daily life a good place to meditate. 